Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Molter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, with that, let's turn our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 22. The title of our study is The Holiness of the Offerings. Now, whether it's manufacturing products, waging wars, governing a nation, or leading a church, everything depends upon leadership, and hopefully good leadership at that. As God's people, we're all one in Christ Jesus and equal before God, but we're different because he's given us gifts and abilities and special callings. We each have a place within the local church. Good leaders will care about people just as Jesus does and allow people to use their giftings to help one another. We'll see that God instructed the priests in this way. And we'll also see that the sacrifices the priests were to offer once again point us to worship. They point us to giving and ultimately they point us to Jesus Christ. So with that, let's take a look at the first nine verses here, and we'll see that the priests were to be careful with the sacred gifts uh, that were brought unto them. So Leviticus chapter 22, picking up here in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they do not profane my holy name by what they dedicate to me. I am the Lord. Say to them, whoever of all of your descendants throughout your generations, who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord, while he has uncleanness upon him, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. Whatever man of the descendants of Aaron, who is a leper or has a discharge, shall not eat the holy offerings until he is clean. And whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse, or a man who has an emission of semen, or anything that touches uh, a creeping thing by which he would be made unclean, or any person by whom he would become unclean, whatever is his uncleanness may be, verse 6, that person who has touched any such thing shall be unclean until evening. And he shall not eat the holy offerings unless he washes his body with water. And when the sun goes down, he shall be clean. And afterward, he may eat the holy offerings because it is his food. Whatever dies naturally or is torn by beasts, he shall not eat. To defile himself with it, I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my ordinance, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby, if they profane it. I, the Lord, sanctify them. We'll pause there. Notice with me here in verse 2, uh, this phrase, separate themselves from the holy things. And this really sets a theme for the rest of this chapter that we'll study together. Uh, it means to treat with regard and respect, to be careful in your handling of these things. You see, the priests were to offer these sacrifices all day long, all week long, all month long, all year long. And they were to do this over and over again. And so it would be easy for them to develop this um, attitude that would turn from sacred ritual into a shallow routine, where they would just kind of go through the motions of what they were doing. And so God wanted them to have this connection with him and, and to understand that the things they were doing uh, were holy. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. But suppose a priest became defiled and he did nothing about it. Would anyone know that he was unclean? He'd be able to go and minister at the altar, offer the sacrifices, eat the lawful share of the, his part of the offerings uh, of meat. No one would seem to know it. But God would know it. 
And the priest would be even in danger of death, as we're told in verse 9 here. So outwardly, it can look like you're doing all the right things. And you're doing those things the right way. But when God looks at your heart, there's nothing that is right taking place there. And so the priest would end up defiling himself, defiling the sacrifices and the altar where he's supposed to be serving the Lord Most High. All who serve the Lord and the Lord's people must be open and honest before God and must minister first to please Him and Him alone. Sadly, there's many in leadership that fail and fall because of hypocrisy. They don't keep a clear conscience before God and they have no fear or respect of God. They have no love and respect towards Him. And oftentimes they always say there's rules for thee, but not for me, right? It's that hypocrisy that takes place. And so the conscience needs to be kept clear. And, and the conscience is like a window that lets in the light, the truth into our lives. Maybe you've seen recently your car window has been covered either by snow or the dirt and the grime from the storms we've had. And it's a little murky, a little brown. Um, if you continue to let that build up over time on your window, it's going to get to the point where it gets kind of hard to see right out the window, whether it's your back window or your front window. Um, and, and that's what happens if we, we let our conscience be defiled a little bit at a time. It can get to the point where uh, Scripture tells us it's seared like as with a hot iron. It, it's no longer sensitive to the things of the Lord. And so it can become uh, darker and harder to see the truth in the light. Uh, Matthew Henry said this teaches us carefully to watch against all moral pollutions, because by them we are hindered to receive the comfort and communion with God. And therefore, if we offend God in those very performances wherein we pretend to honor Him, we provoke Him instead of pleasing Him. We profane God's name by our uncleanness, which pretends to be hallowed to Him. So God wants us to be real, open, and honest with him. There's a phrase out there in the world that says, fake it till you make it. That doesn't work before the Lord. Um, he knows exactly what's going on in your heart. King Saul tried that for a season, and everything looked like he was doing kind of okay. And then uh, Samuel the prophet came and said, hey, what's this I hear that you didn't listen to the Lord? You weren't obedient to him. Well, I was keeping the best for the Lord. Sure you were. <laughs> so God's looking at the heart, right? God can see our motives for why we're doing what we're doing. And so we have to keep that clear conscience before the Lord, and especially those of us who are Christian leaders, uh, those who of us are parents, uh, those of us who are uh, maybe leaders in the workplace as well. Uh, we have people underneath us that to report to us. We need to have that clear conscience, right? We want to do what is right, even when no one else is looking, because the truth is, God is always looking. Well, next here in verse 10 through 16, we'll see there's some compensation for the priest. And uh, we see that here in verse 10 through verse 16. No outsider shall eat the holy offering. One who dwells with the priest or a hired servant shall not eat the holy thing. But if the priest buys a person with his money, he may eat it and one who is born in his house may eat his food. If the priest's daughter is married to an outsider, she may not eat of the holy offerings. But if the priest's daughter is a widow or divorced and has no child, has returned to her father's house as in her youth, she may eat her father's food, but no outsider shall eat it. Verse 14. And if any man eats the holy offerings unintentionally, then he shall restore a holy offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. They shall not profane the holy offerings of the children of Israel, which they offer to the Lord, or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings. For I, the Lord, sanctify them. We'll pause there. Now, in this section, we see very clearly it's saying that no stranger to the family of the priests were to eat the holy things. And if he did, he must make restitution. He had to pay a fine, so to speak, uh, to make things right. 
You see that the, the things that were brought for sacrifice, the, the, the meat offerings, there was a portion of that that was allowed for the priest to partake of, uh, for them to eat and enjoy. But they were not to give that food out to strangers. And if he had company, he wasn't to offer the company the food that had been sacrificed to the Lord. It was for the Levites. It was a holy offering. And so it wasn't meant to be eaten by him and his immediate family only. Uh, but suppose a priest was too generous and with God's offerings, and he was including all kinds of outsiders to come and eat of these holy offerings, he would sin against the Lord and sin against his guest. And that unqualified guest would then have to bring a trespass offering, uh, plus we see a fine or to make restitution, to add one-fifth to it, and that would begin to make that meal very expensive uh, for him to come and partake of. In other words, we see that the priest had to know what God required of him, and yet he also had to be honest and have the courage to say no both to himself and to those who wanted to do something else. This would include any daughters that had married outside of the priestly family. Uh, and so his loving heart would probably want to include them in the feast, right? What father wouldn't want to uh, have his daughter and, and maybe son-in-law come over and enjoy. But again, these were holy offerings, and so they weren't allowed to do so. And including them would only hurt them, um, as force them to pay that fine of restitution. Uh, Warren Wiersbe said, one of the most difficult things in Christian ministry is having to say no. But to keep our fellowship pure before God, we sometimes must do that. The pastor refuses to marry a believer to an unbeliever, often makes enemies among their relatives. But he keeps his conscience pure before God. And parents who forbid their children to cultivate uh, dangerous and damaging relationships with others, uh, and their kids are often misunderstood, but they know they're doing the will of God. So this means that as, as pastor, uh, as church leaders, as parents, we need to have a backbone. We need to know what the truth is, to stand up for the truth. We need to learn when to say no to others, and say no to sin, and say yes to the Lord, yes to the things of God. And so it's courage that we need, courage for the Christian to have the motivation to know what God says and have the conviction to do what is right. And again, to do that right thing, even though there may be consequences. Right? We know Joseph, for example, uh, Potiphar's wife made advances at him. He said, how can I do such a, a wicked and evil thing before God? He didn't want to defile his conscience before God. And, and yet he was falsely imprisoned and there were consequences. But God used that and restored him to a high office to save his family. So we need to know that we need to have that courage and a conviction that God knows what is best for us, to listen to the Lord and what he says for us. And at the same time, we need to know the response that we get back from people is not always positive and encouraging. The truth is sometimes uh, we will be fearful, but when we lean on God, we find our strength. God will give us the courage to stand for what's right and what's true. God will give us the courage for evangelism and teaching people the word of God. I believe that a real biblical leader is one who follows the Lord, follows Jesus Christ as their example. And the truth is, if they're doing the will of God, they're understanding that they're being led by the Lord as well. Because Jesus Christ is the best leader of all time. And so, uh, as a pastor, as a father, as maybe a Christian leader, uh, I, I desire to be led by Christ so that I can lead this church fellowship, I can lead my family, I can lead others in the community and in my workplace towards the Lord Jesus Christ. But I have to be led by Him in order to lead others. And so we want to know what God's Word says. We want to let our yes be yes and our no be no, based upon not what we say, but based upon what God's word says for us. So we need to have that conviction and that backbone to stand for truth and for righteousness defined in God's word for us. Well, next here in verse 17 through verse 25, we'll see that God has um, some uh, rules around unblemished sacrifices and what he's requiring when there are sacrifices that are brought to him. So let's see that here in 
Leviticus chapter 2, picking up in verse 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, Whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel who offers a sacrifice for any of his vows or for any of his free will offerings, which they offer to the Lord as a burnt offering, you shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep, or from the goats. Whatever has a defect you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow or a free will offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Either a bull or a lamb has any limb too long or too short, you may offer as a free will offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. You shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut. You shall not make any offering of them to offering of them in your land. Nor from a foreigner's hand shall you offer any of these as the bread of your God, because their corruption is in them and defects are in them. They shall not be accepted on your behalf. We'll pause there. We see now that God is talking about when these offerings were brought to him, that they were not to be unblemished or have defects in them. And when you gave something to the Lord, as we see, it was a free will offering. No one was forcing them or, or, or putting them in a headlock that they had to give to the Lord. It came from their heart. It was of their own free will to give unto the Lord. And so if they did that, though, they couldn't offer an animal that had blemishes. In other words, they were to take care of their animals. And if there was an animal that really had of no value, uh, to, to sell in the marketplace, they weren't to try and then pass that off and give that to the Lord. It reminds me of a story I heard of a young boy who was given two quarters on a Sunday morning with the instructions that one was for the Lord, it was to be placed in the church offering plate, and the other coin was for himself. And so off the church service, he went walking uh, on the way there. And as he walked along the sidewalk, thinking about how he would spend his quarter holding both of them in his hand, soon one of them slipped through his fingers, bounced off the curb, and went right into the gutter, and you guessed it, right into the drain. And he gave it his best thought on what to do with the situation, and came up with a perfect solution, he thought. And then he proclaimed, well, Lord, there goes your quarter. <laughs> and I'm afraid sometimes we are like that with the Lord. We can have this idea that I was intending to give that to you, Lord, but circumstances have changed now, and, and well, I'll give you this one instead. And what we want to make sure is that when we give to God, we, we give to him first and not last after everything else is done. See, God isn't interested in just the, the broken down, leftover things to be offered to him. And giving to God, it's, again, it's always of our free will. If we're going to give to him, he wants uh, the choice. He wants the first. He wants the best. He wants those things that cost a little bit of our life, a little bit of a sacrifice. So giving to God should not be something that really has no cost to us, something that really is non-sacrificial. Um, God wants us to honor him, to show our love to him, and, and, and have that importance in that relationship. In the book of Malachi, he would talk about this, that uh, God would tell the people, would you offer your offering to the governor? In other words, would you give this to someone of high status in your community as a gift? If not, then you probably shouldn't be then trying to pass that off and give that to the Lord. Uh, Matthew Henry said, this is an instruction for us to offer to God the best we have in our spiritual sacrifices. If our devotions are ignorant and cold and trifling, full of distractions, we're offering the blind, the lame, and the sick for a sacrifice unto the Lord. So we have to be careful in what we are giving and giving with the right motive. Last week, I was made aware that two of my boys placed 
some money in the offering box. A um, person that was unaware that one of them was going to do that, and the, the younger one, I felt, was going to put in too much, <laughs> more than I was comfortable in him taking out of his money jar uh, to give as an offering. And as I wrestled with that, I thought, you know, uh, as parents, Anna and I have tried to cultivate um, this, this generosity in our family and in our kids. And I thought, you know what, it's a great example. If they want to be generous with what they have, who am I to stop them from wanting to be generous? They're giving from the right heart unto the Lord. If that's what they want to do, then so be it. And so um, I was encouraged by that and it just reminded me that, you know, God doesn't really care how much we give. He cares that why we're giving. We're giving with the right motive, the love that we have for him, giving from the heart. Again, at, here at Calvary Chapel, we will never pass the plate. Uh, we will never force you to give. We'll never tell others how much people are giving. Um, we just don't do that. That's between you and the Lord. It's an act of worship between you and God. And I know many of us give in different ways. We give of our, our financial money. We can give of our time. We can give of our talents. We can give of all of those things. And uh, as, as our family, we tithe as well. Uh, and so we just, we want to be that example unto the Lord for our kids to see that mom and dad are living out their faith. And, um, and so it was encouraging to see their generosity. Um, and again, God's not interested in the amount that's given. It's not even his consideration. And you recall Jesus, when he was in the temple with his disciples, uh, kind of pulled them aside and say, hey, come watch as people give money into the treasury. And they were watching all these really important people come in and put money in, in the offering box there in the treasury of the temple. And then this elderly lady comes in, she's a widow, and she has a mite, which is like one-tenth of a penny. And she puts that in the offering box, and then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, I tell you the truth, this woman has put in more than anyone else. They gave out of their abundance, she gave of her livelihood. She needed that to live off of, and yet she gave with the right heart, with the right intention. So it reminds me that God's not really concerned with the amount that we give. He's concerned with the motive. He's concerned with that heart of why we're giving. And the truth is, if we understand uh, what the scripture says, God owns it all anyway. He's just calling us to be stewards with what we have. And he wants us to be good stewards with those resources. And I'm so blessed by such fine people in this fellowship that have a heart to give uh, unto the Lord. Again, I couldn't have imagined uh, a year ago that we would be in this building. Um, I kind of was thinking we'd be there at the YMCA for a lot longer. Um, and so I'm thankful that the Lord has opened the doors for us to have a place of our own and and that uh, we've got, uh, the bills are being paid, the utilities and all those things, and we're able to keep doing what we're doing unto the Lord and giving to those in the community as well and, uh, and helping uh, like the Health Resource Center and others. And so I think this fellowship is gonna have some of the greatest rewards in heaven for giving from the heart. And so I just wanna say thank you to all of those of you who are giving uh, and your obedience to the Lord and your desire to, to bless the Lord, but to also to bless this fellowship, to help people, um, and we've also given a little bit uh, from our fellowship to help those in Ukraine. Uh, there's some Calvary chapels there on the ground and a Samaritan's Purse. And so I know that God is using what is given here and using it in our local community, but then using it as across the world as well to share the gospel and, and be a tangible uh, witness to uh, people of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in this last section, verse 26 through verse 33, we'll see this uh, phrase again, it's the Lord who makes holy. And we've kind of been seeing that at the end of every one of these sections, that it's the Lord who sanctifies, it's the Lord who is holy. And we'll see that uh, very clearly here in this final section in verse 26 to the end of the chapter here in verse 33. So picking up here in verse uh, 26, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and free. Uh, excuse me. And from the eighth day and thereafter, it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to the Lord. Whether it's a cow or a ewe, uh, do not kill both her and the young on the same day. And when you offer sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offered of your own free will, on the same day it shall be eaten. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. 
verse 31, Therefore you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am the Lord. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. We see in this final section that God had a couple special things regarding the animal sacrifices. We see that they were not to bring uh, uh, an animal that was just born. It had to be at least eight days old. And when I thought about this, I thought, you know, this really, to me, shows me the tender heart of our Creator. Uh, See, this calf or this young lamb that was less than a week old, it was transported in any distance to the sanctuary. It could die in that process. As you know, if you've got kids or, or small animals, you know that when they're born, and in fact, sometimes even when they're older, they're completely dependent upon the parent, right? They're kind of helpless. And so we see God's desires that um, it would be cruel for the mother and her young to be killed on that same day for whatever purposes. And as I was mulling over that and thinking on that, I thought, you know, this is a good reminder that in ministry we're to be compassionate. We're not to be cruel. And I think in fulfilling our religious duties to the Lord, we have to be careful not to be heartless, uncaring in the way we use what God has provided for us. We have to be good stewards with it. Again, uh, a nation, uh, a church, uh, a, a business rises and falls with leadership. Good leadership, bad leadership. And if you're looking to that leadership, you're hoping they care about people. It's not just about the prophet but they're, they actually have compassion towards those um, that they have influence and responsibility over. And so I thought this was interesting because I've heard uh, from more than one social critic that has pointed out that the way people treat animals gradually becomes the way that they treat humans. And it's interesting, today we see there's a big push over animal rights and that animals need to be treated decently and fairly Um, and yet there's been a little lacking in that for humans. Uh, And so people are now using that comparison that, hey, if you're going to protect the life uh, of an animal within its mother's womb, shouldn't you do that with the human as well? If you're going to say that uh, this egg from an eagle is protected, shouldn't uh, the embryo within a mom be protected as well? And so we see that this picture here that God is using that we should be careful uh, in all that he provides for us. We also see in this section that there were some food sacrifices, these sacrifices of thanksgiving that were to be partaken of and eaten the same day they were offered to the Lord. Again, there's this beautiful picture of fellowship, especially in the Middle Eastern culture. uh, A lot of things are centered around food. In fact, even other parts of the world. In fact, you go to Italy, Very big on food there. I remember Ann and I got to go there, and um, we went out to eat once uh, with a group, and uh, we were having uh, a supper, and uh, we ate as much as we could, and they said, oh, this is just course one. We're like, what do you mean the first course? Oh, there's there's five courses. I'm like, oh, I better loosen my belt buckle here. (laughs) There's going to be a lot of food. And, and it was probably about a two-hour meal. And I thought, this was just fantastic to eat and a fellowship and connect with people, have conversation. Um, and that's very common around the world. In fact, there are some areas where uh, they take kind of a siesta after lunch. They'll take a couple hours off. Everyone rests, and then they go back to work. And um, they realize the importance of connection, that, that importance of relationships. And it just reminds me that that that's God's desire behind this, this fellowship Thanksgiving offering as well. He wanted to connect with the priest. He wanted to fellowship with the priest. And it reminds me that as a pastor, I can only uh, give to people what I've received from the Lord. I can only take my family so far and disciple them in the things of the Lord as I am allowing the Lord to disciple me. I can't give to others what I haven't received. And so it's the importance that we're being discipled by the Lord. We're having that fellowship time with the Lord. And so we can see that God's providing exactly what we need. 
a way to have fellowship with him, a way to thank him for his goodness and, and all the physical and spiritual nourishment that he provides for us. Again, God is not interested in taking from us. Not at all. That's not God's heart. His desire is fellowship with us. And the lie that we see from the beginning in the book of Genesis is that sacrifices will create favor with God. Cain and Abel uh, show us this. One of the brothers thought that he could just offer whatever he wanted and that it would bring favor with God, and, and yet um, it didn't. Uh, Abel offered a better sacrifice because it was of faith. It was what God required, but he also offered it with the right heart to fellowship with God. And so we don't want to be going through the motions. We want to have that relationship. You've probably heard me say this before here. We're not about religion. Man trying to appease God and do works or sacrifices to earn favor with God or get his way to heaven. We're about relationship. We recognize that Jesus Christ has already come down. He's already bridged that gap, right? Jesus was perfect. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose from the dead. And he, he bridged that gap from heaven to earth. And for the way to us, have fellowship with God the Father is through God the Son. We don't have to do works to earn favor with God. He adopts us into his family as his beloved children. Now, there are things that we can do that... Um, will hinder that closeness with him, hinder that relationship with him. And when that happens, we need to repent, ask him to forgive us, and then step back into that relationship with him. Because if you feel distant from God, guess who took a step back? It wasn't God, it was us. And God's always there with his arms open, ready to receive us back. He wants that closeness with us. He wants that fellowship with us because he loves us. And so we see that, that through Christ's sacrifice, it creates the favor with God. It covers the wrongdoing. And all the Old Testament sacrifices point us to this picture of this future provision that's found in Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. And that's why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus approaching, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew that Jesus was going to be that perfect sacrifice for us. So God is the one who makes us holy, set apart, uh, and he desires that fellowship with us. So how do we grow spiritually? We grow through studying the word of God. We will never grow in grace and knowledge until the Bible becomes a part of our lives, until we read the word of God, listen to the word of God, think about the word of God. Psalm 1 talks about this. Blesses the man who who meditates on the law day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf does not wither, whose, whose fruit produces in every season. And so we want to be fruitful for the Lord. We want to meditate on his word. We want to think through what does this mean? How does this apply? How do I know what to do in the situation based upon your word and what I know to be true about you, Lord? Those are the things that God desires for us to, to think through in our day-to-day -day walk with him. We also grow in our relationship with him by our fellowship with him. And that's more than just a verse of the day. I know that's it's nothing bad about that, but it needs to be more than that. It needs to be more than just a Sunday sermon. It needs to be something that we connect with the Lord on a personal level. And that can look different. That can look like reading the word, listening to the word, having discussion as a family around the Word of God. Uh, but the focus is on desiring to know what the Bible says so then we can live it out and apply it in our lives. We also grow through prayer and through fellowship with other believers like we're doing here today. And then finally, we grow by witnessing. We grow by sharing our faith with others. And I, I remember when I first did that in California, I went out and I shared the gospel. I shared my testimony with someone at, in the park sitting down on the bench with them. Um, and I thought, you know, how do I swing this conversation towards the spiritual? And I had just finished a book uh, by Mark Cahill called One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. And the one thing you can't do in heaven uh, is witness uh, because everyone there is already there. Now, you probably can't, you can't sin there either, but um, hopefully you wouldn't want to do that there. Um, but you, you, even if you want to witness there, you really can't because everyone who's saved is, is saved. Everyone who's not there is not there. And so I remember talking to this teacher, 
And it was after the Columbine uh, shooting massacre. And I asked him if he had heard about that. And he said, yes, I, he heard about that. And, and um, I said, what do you think happened to those people? Where do they go? And he said, you know, I'm not really sure. I, I kind of wonder if there's, there's a heaven and if there's an afterlife. And then boom, our one hour conversation turned into two and a half hours. And we began to talk about spiritual things. And he began to ask me all kinds of questions. And um, I just remember after that conversation, just like this was amazing to talk to someone about the Lord. But then it, it fired me up to want to get back into the word of God. Because he asked some questions and I, had, I told him, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, but I'd like to know, and so let me find out the answer, and, and I got his email address, and I'll, and I'll get that information back to you. Um, and so when you witness to people, when you share your testimony, you share your faith in Christ, it'll draw you into understanding more of the things of the Lord. It'll deepen your faith in the Lord. And just as physical exercise makes us stronger, so too exercising our faith, sharing it with others, makes us spiritually stronger as well. There's a term that you have probably have heard of, it's called apologetics. It's not that we are apologizing for our Christian faith, it's that we're equipped to share the Christian faith. We have an answer for a reason for the hope that lies within us. And I, I believe that that's very important within the church today that we're equipped on how do we have these conversations with others? How do we answer their questions? How do we evangelize and be a witness to the world around us? Again, it's the Lord who makes holy. He desires us to be set apart unto him and then set apart in leading others to his throne of grace and holiness. So in closing, everything depends upon leadership, good leadership, bad leadership. Uh, good leaders are gonna care about people just as Jesus does, right? Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. In fact, all, again, all the sacrifices point us to the worship and to the giving, but it's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, who would suffer and die on the cross for our sins, be buried in that tomb, and rise again from the third day according to the scriptures. So Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. Jesus is perfect in his nature, both as God and man. Jesus is perfect in his motive, his personality, and his obedience to the Father, and he's perfect in his sacrifice for sin on our behalf and his resurrection from the dead. And I'll be honest, when a pastor is fully surrendered to the Lord, sometimes the sermon will convict us just as those who hear the message. And so oftentimes, uh, what you need to hear is the same thing that I need to hear as well. And so you need to know that God's in control of your life. Uh, he's with you even right now. You don't have to be afraid of what's going on in the world. Um, you can trust him with everything that's taking place. He's your good shepherd, he's your heavenly father, he's your high priest and your king and your friend. So may we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and may we continue to pursue him above all else. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for allowing us uh, the ability to study your word together here this morning. We ask, God, that you'd continue to cultivate this relationship between us and you. Help us, Lord, to continue to pursue you above all the distractions and all the things that draw for our attention. We ask, God, that you continue to purify us and make us holy, set us apart from the things of this world. Peel back those layers like an onion, the, the worldly things that are, are trying to, to change us and conform us. God, we ask that as we study your word, as we uh, be f are filled with your spirit, empowered to be a witness, we ask, God, that you would help us uh, to no longer be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, to know your perfect and pleasing will for us, and that by your spirit you'd empower us uh, to share this message with those around us, to share the truth and the hope that we have to this world. And God, we do pray if there would be any here among us this morning or maybe listening online or watching this message who need to surrender their lives to you. They don't know you as their Savior and their Lord or even as their closest friend. God, we ask that you convict them of their sin and convince them of your amazing love. If that's you and say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me, I need to get right with God. 
I need to become born again. I believe that God loves me, died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And I'm ready to turn my life over to him. If that's you this morning, I simply want to leave you in a prayer where you make that decision to surrender your life to God. And based upon God's word, you become born again as you put your full weight of your trust and your faith in him. If that's you this morning, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I recognize that my sin separates me from you. And God, I realize that you love me. That Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. That you were buried and rose from the dead on the third day. God, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and my life. Be my Savior and my Lord. God, I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for loving me and for adopting me into your family. I pray you'd help me to follow you from this day forward. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Jesus Christ or perhaps rededication, let me know. I'd love to encourage you, pray with you, uh, give you a Bible if you don't have one. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Mulder of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word cover to cover. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries. Check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Life to you I give shout from the inside out.